all or most of you may know that I am a left above the knee amputee. In this video, I will discuss how and why I became an amputee. On March 11, 2021, I woke up in the early morning hours of the morning, somewhere between 2 and 3 a.m. to go to the restroom. And I realized that I could not see. I'm not sure how much time had passed, but I realized the reason I could not see was because my nightshirt had fallen over my face. I was upside down in the corner of the bathroom. I was in the water closet area of the bathroom. So I sat on the floor and it's a very small area so i had a leg on each side of the commode and my back was against the wall and i tried to determine what just happened and why did i suddenly pass out but in the midst of thinking of those things my left leg began to fall asleep i started patting it knowing that I needed to get up off the floor because I needed to get back to bed so that I could get up for work in the morning. But in the midst of patting the left leg, it began to wake up and the right leg then began to fall asleep. So now I'm patting the right leg, trying to make sure that it wakes up. I'm also trying to be a little quiet because I didn't want to wake my husband. And at some point, which was a very short amount of time, he came to the bathroom door to find out what was going on. I guess I didn't realize that I was probably patting my leg a little bit harder than I thought. And um, I told him to come in and help me pat my leg. And he had to kind of squeeze the top portion of his body in. And he's trying to help me. But he was also a little panicked. I remember, he's just woken up. He has no idea why I'm on the floor. I was unable to tell him anything besides just simply ask him to help pat my leg to wake it up. And the pain was intensifying literally by like the millisecond it was becoming worse and worse and worse and so i'm actually beating my leg by this time and within probably less than a minute or at the minute a minute at most i just yelled out to call 911 um he left that area he told me he would go call them. He also needed to get the tools to take the door off so that they could get me out of the water closet area. But once he left out, I became claustrophobic and I screamed, get me out of here. But he was already going to go call 911. So I pushed myself as close as possible to the commode. I literally squeezed against it and pull the door past me to get out of that small area. And um, I was still on the floor and I put my leg up against the wall, hoping that that would help in some way. But this pain was just unimaginable. Um, and all I could do by that point was scream. There was nothing more that I could do. I continued to scream. Um, ironically, I just kept saying, God, please help me. Um, and that was really all the words that I could form from that point on. Um, he came back and of course found me already out of the water closet area on the floor. He had already called 911. They're pretty close to here. So it probably only took a couple of minutes for them to get here. Long story short, we left and I don't remember a whole lot because I believe that I must have started kind of going in and out of it during the uh, transport to the hospital. I didn't even know what hospital we were going to. And I remember still just screaming, being erratic. It was just awful. And I, 
I couldn't really take the pain more or less. Um, and we eventually made it to the hospital. When we did, I remember them opening the doors of the ambulance and saying, okay, okay, we're here. We're going to get you some help. So I'm assuming I must have been still screaming, God, please help me. And honestly, from that point, that's all I remember. I don't remember going into the hospital. I don't remember anything else that happened from that point on until probably the end of March. Um, and so the rest of everything that I know is basically from accounts from my family. And um, part of that was my husband finding out they reported to him later that morning that I actually had a blood clot in my right leg and they had decided that they would do surgery, I guess, to release the pressure of that. He's not necessarily sure if in the midst of the surgery, because I did have surgery, if during that the clot moved. However, the clots did move. They traveled to my lungs. Again, not really sure if this is the part that things started going downhill, but I suffered two cardiac arrests. Um, they basically were doing everything that they could after that point to keep me alive, but they just didn't have the resources. So they had to call um, Emory University here in Atlanta and get their help of using an ECMO machine, which I myself was not familiar with. My husband nor my mom were familiar with. He had um, got my mom, my mom involved and the two of them had come to the hospital. They had decided that Emory would come and put an ECMO machine on me. And then later I would be transported to Emory. Um, fast forward, uh, it was a, a, a very rocky road. They were actually told that I would not make it through the morning of March 12th. So they had to come and say their final goodbyes. And, um, you know, obviously this was a pretty rough thing for them. So there's so much that they do and do not remember. But long story short, I was, I had many surgeries in between. I was uh, opened to find out that possibly due to the resuscitation events that I had suffered some internal bleeding. My liver, I believe, was severed in they're not sure how that happened, but um, they began doing surgeries on me to repair the internal things that were uh, going on and to help me survive through this issue. They then left me open for quite a few days. A little odd, but <laughs> I guess that's the way that it works. They leave you open so they don't have to keep opening you to continue to do uh, numerous surgeries depending on what is wrong. So I had a lot of surgeries between that day and fast forward to March 15th on this day they decide that they are going to remove the ECMO. They're going to, well, they're going to close me. They're going to remove the ECMO, but because of some other complications, they were not able to do so. And I will not get into those details, but they, my family had to make a decision for March 16th to decide that I would have two major surgeries on that day one of which was the amputation. So on March 16, 2021, I had the amputation on my left leg above the knee. And it's probably a little odd only because this began with a blood clot in my right leg. And 
ultimately my left leg was amputated. But the reason for the amputation was actually because of the ECMO device. Um, there were some things that I've learned later and initially I assumed it was because of ECMO, but after having a filter, I'd also had a, a filter placed in to prevent the blood clots from going to my heart because they were concerned that uh, obviously if the clots went there, there was nothing they could do. So a filter was placed in on either March, I believe it was placed on March 12th. So a year later, the filter was removed. And after having that done, I had a follow-up with the vascular surgeon. He's the same one that placed the filter, removed the filter, did the amputation. Um, he also uh, repaired some nerve damage from the ECMO machine. So we had a conversation about why I actually became an amputee. I recorded that conversation. Obviously, I would not play that that conversation for confidentiality reasons, but I did create a blog with a transcript of that conversation. And if you'd like to read more about it, you can visit my website at cutabovetheknee.com and you can go to the blog section and that blog is there. It's about a 10, 11 minute read and he discusses some of the things that were actually very shocking to me about my chances of even survival without the ECMO device. And so I'm very gracious for their efforts in keeping me alive. Obviously me calling out to God early on because that's who makes the decisions of when you go. And I believe it just simply wasn't my time or God decided that that was not the day. So I'm obviously forever gracious to God. I'm gracious to my to the hospital staff, to the doctors, to the nurses, to the staff even at Northside in coming who decided that I needed more than what they were capable of doing and that they were not going to be able to keep me on alive on the devices that they had available in on regular life support. And so I did need something a little bit more invasive to keep me around and so again I'm I'm grateful to the staff at Emory University and I'm grateful to all of my nurses I'm grateful to my husband and my mom and my family and friends for keeping me in prayers and my husband and mom making really tough decisions and of course it's still been during the time of COVID they weren't even allowed to visit me most of the time um, to even see what was going on or understand some of the things it was just constant phone call after phone call and so I can only imagine the mental anguish that they were going through during this tough time but again if you'd like to read that blog, that blog is available at my website. I also have others that are available there, and I appreciate your time. Have a blessed day.